I'm terrified of having children, not because they smell or that they scream for no reason, but seriously, kudos to all the parents out there because wow. And not because I would be a terrible parent, despite what some of my alleged friends might have to say, but because I'm actually very concerned about bringing them into this planet that is becoming increasingly uncomfortable and dangerous to inhabit. One of my biggest fears is having my child 20 years from now, maybe even sooner, look me in the eyes and say, Mom, you knew it was going to be like this? We must make decisions today that offset that question from ever being asked. I would be so much more confident about our future if the decisions we were making were entrenched in science, in facts, but they're really not. And when they're not, precious resources are misspent. Time, money, productivity are lost. So if not data, what are our decision inputs? I have dedicated my career to understanding what factors influence our perceptions of risks and how those risks trump reality in terms of our decision-making and behavioral outcomes. It turns out we are not rational attributors of risk, which then means we are not rational decision makers. Let's try this, for example, to help me convince you. What do you think is more likely to kill you? A shark attack or falling airplane parts? If you're like most people who answer this poll, you're likely to say a shark attack. It's more sensational, easier to recall, even though falling airplane parts are 30 times more likely to kill you. So what's going on here? We clearly aren't judging risk accurately. Since the dawn of our species, our brains have been designed to confront and react in certain ways to the risks around us. We are designed to overreact to risks that are novel, unfamiliar, and have the potential for catastrophic consequences. And honestly, that's worked out well for us, for the most part. Our ancestors would see a poisonous snake and immediately jumpstart the response system to hopefully run away. There were cues in the environment that would help their brains scan and process the risk. For example, what is the color of the snake? What's its position and stance? Are there other animals around? Most of this processing and subsequent decision-making was subliminal and automated. That's a relief. Can you imagine if our ancestors needed to take the time to really process the risk? The snake would have won, and we likely wouldn't be here today. The risks we face now are starkly different from those of our ancestors, but the way our brains are wired are not. We find ourselves in a complex, interconnected risk landscape, and even though we have more time to make decisions about the risk we face, we still tend to make snap judgments. None of us are immune to this not even those of us who study it. We systematically overestimate risks that aren't that serious, like vaccinating our children or eating non-organic foods. And we systematically underestimate risks that are serious, like the potential for a disease outbreak to ground our lives to a screeching halt. We think to ourselves, it won't happen to us. We're programmed to be overconfident. We're programmed to ignore serious seemingly far away and slow moving risks, like rising sea levels. This is how our brain wiring dictates our perceptions. We are influenced by triggers, such as whether or not we can see the risk or whether or not we trust the person communicating about the risk to us. Even robust findings from the field of sociology show us how our political identities can influence our perceptions of risk. For example, those who identify as conservatives in America are more likely to perceive lower risk of COVID-19 and police brutality as compared to those who identify as progressives. Additionally, well-established triggers in the field of risk perception, a sampling of which you can see here, include factors such as how voluntary is the risk? How sensational is it? Remember those shark attacks? There is a reason we are wired to make snap judgments based on seemingly unrelated context cues. It is a human evolutionary trait designed to help us avoid cognitive dissonance or that uncomfortable feeling we get when we are confronted with information that might be contradictory to our entrenched beliefs, which may be integral to our identity, to our tribe. The visceral need to belong to a tribe is intrinsically human. From our early ancestors who needed to belong to a group for their very survival, 
to modern day. Just look at an increasingly polarized America, where we see people on both sides of the spectrum digging in their heels on a host of issues, just to stay true to their political tribal identity, even issues historically and generally free from politicalization, like infectious disease, are not immune. No pun intended there. As science is becoming increasingly politicized, I am definitely on the front lines of experiencing it. I have network producers scratching their heads, trying to figure out how to label me. Am I a liberal scientist or a conservative scientist? Can I just be a scientist? Apparently not. It's not how we're wired. When I'm in the media and I'm presenting on climate science, I have the extreme right calling me a Kool-Aid drinking Al Gore, Kool-Aid drinking liberal. And when I'm presenting on evidence that might contradict severe social distancing measures, now I'm a Trump supporter. I clearly can't win. But if I have to choose an identity in this time of politicized science, let it be radical centrist. And that I value facts above all else. It's a lonely position to occupy, but that's a whole nother TED talk. I'm not complaining. I have chosen to be an unapologetic communicator of the science of the facts, and I thrive in it. I know that the interpretation and reception of my messages will be based on those innate biases, and I also know that correcting for existing erroneous beliefs. Will require us to first admit and accept that we are being subliminally influenced by cognitive triggers that are beyond our control. But we can regain control of our decisions. First, we need to recognize what fuels our perceptions. Is it our political identity? Is it the ease of recall? Is it trust in the communicator? We need to see what feeds our fears, question our initial judgments, and ultimately. Question whether or not we are overreacting to the base rate statistics of a particular risk. Just look and see how wrong we get it. Actual risk versus the perception of risk are rarely aligned. From those we overestimate, like plane crashes, to those we underestimate, like radon gas, these are cognitive shortcomings. But we know this now, and we can do the due diligence, and we can do the research. To recognize that we need to get a grasp on reality, and ultimately to become better aligned to the facts. This is step one of what you can do at an individual level to help address the looming challenges ahead for us. Challenges that will require us to make tough decisions entrenched in science, not in ideology. You too beca can become radical in your commitment to the facts, to the science, and then you can think about challenging your family, your friends. And the, your communities to also follow suit. You will inevitably get pushback. I certainly do. Early on in my media career, I was interviewed by Bill O'Reilly. Yes, that Bill O'Reilly, on whether a recent National Climate Assessment report that had just come out was bogus or not. I spoke the facts as true now as they were then, and the abuse I received, then and now, I was called a mouthpiece for evil. I was told to go back to my home country, you know, the foreign state of New Jersey. I'm not gonna lie; I actually got a kick out of it. I thought to myself, "This must be what a Kardashian feels like." But seriously, making waves and getting reactions means that people are listening. They're lashing out because of the cognitive dissonance that they feel. That's normal. We're potentially challenging entrenched beliefs and even people's identities. We need to have compassion for others. We need to find common ground, and we need to consistently reach out. There's no alternative. Inaction is costing us precious time from veering off a path that is taking us to a global temperature point that we will not be able to withstand. We are currently on target to reach it by 2050. Sure, we've heard this before. There's approximately a decade left to turn the tide on a warming planet. This may sound inflammatory to some of you, but my friends. As the planet heats up and as the global human population increases, we can anticipate increased habitat encroachment and destruction, which means increased engagement with exotic wild animals that we haven't historically engaged with: bats, porcupines, snakes, for food, for trade. All of this increases the likelihood of disease to emerge. And remember, COVID-19 is a mild disease by virology standards. There is potential for far more lethal disease to emerge, 
And we've seen from COVID-19 just how disruptive even a mild virus can be. Increasing emerging and infectious diseases alongside more frequent and intense hurricanes, droughts, wildfires, tornadoes can be overwhelming, can make some of us feel like we shouldn't be procreating. So let's have compassion for those who fear for the next generation and their perceived role in that future suffering, like me. Let's also recognize that it's just a perception, and now we know the limits to our perceptions. We have the human ingenuity to overcome the challenges we face and to regain control of our perceptions. Let's confront our brains, let's tease out our innate biases, and let's better align to the science, to the data, for better, faster, more evidence-based decisions for our families, communities, and our very existence. I do want children. I want to be able to see my kids play outside without time limits because of dangerous heat. We can have that future, a future where we are not just surviving, but thriving. A planet that is cleaner, more efficient, more equitable, it can be a reality. But we need to start by making better decisions now.